The Central Intelligence Agency is an institution defined by the unsung heroes that chart its course. This is the story of two extraordinary men. John Downey and Richard Fecto joined the agency in 1951 looking for adventure. Shot down on a clandestine flight into communist territory, they survived two decades of hardship in Chinese prisons. They refused to become victims. They never lost hope, and they knew the agency would never abandon them. It's a story that lay in the recesses of institutional memory until it came to the attention of the director of Central Intelligence, George Tenet. I thought, what better way to give great incentive by the evidence of what they sacrificed, the heroism that they displayed? What better way to teach younger officers? In 1998, Tenet brought the men back to Langley to receive the director's medal not in recognition for a mission that succeeded, but rather to honor the way they coped with a mission that failed. We are forever proud that you are our colleagues. You have been an inspiration to intelligence officers who served with you and to the generations that have followed you. Your, so your story, simply put, is one of the most remarkable in the 50 years of the Central Intelligence Agency. Nicholas Dumovich, one of the agency's staff historians, agrees. In 2006, he undertook an exhaustive review of the classified record. I delved into the archives, uh, the actual operational records, the memoranda, and was able to piece together what really happened. In those files, he discovered both men recorded detailed debriefings shortly after they returned. Interview, Richard Fico with James J. White, 10 January. The story of Fecto and Downey opens in 1951 at the height of the Korean War. U.S. tanks cross the 38th parallel pushing north. The first engagement of the Cold War had turned red hot. That summer, hundreds of graduating college seniors across America saw the CIA as their way into the fight. Korean War broke out in June of 50, and you might say my generation, my little narrow post-war generation, uh, that was our war, and it was uh, something that we had to deal with. We were all gung-ho. Uh, we thought, this is it. We're going to get something done. It's something important. <laughs> Both were recruited into an agency born out of the OSS, an agency that turned from fighting fascism to rolling back the communist tide. The paramilitary function was huge uh, and growing. We sent our men to Fort Benning to learn how to jump out of aircraft. Uh, we sent them to the range to learn uh, about weapons. Uh, we sent them to specialized uh, training courses to learn about the communist threat. In October 1949, Chinese communist forces led by Mao Zedong seized power from the Chinese nationalists and established the People's Republic of China. Washington refused to recognize its legitimacy. Instead, the CIA embarked on a course designed to undermine and eventually overthrow the Chai Kham regime. The third force program was really a kind of covert action program, a very ambitious one, where we were hoping that we could uh, unite with a third force in China, that is, neither the communists nor the discredited, we thought at the time, nationalists, and try and bring that group, to, uh, make them stronger and possibly bring them into power. By the spring of 1952, Jack Downey was in the Far East area of operations, training ethnic Chinese agents to operate in communist territory. But from the beginning, security was compromised. People housed together, training together, and once they learned of their uh, missions, they talked among each other. Uh, so betrayal of one team would lead to betrayal of others, unfortunately. The first team parachuted into mainland China and was never heard from again. The second unit dropped into Manchuria in July and quickly established radio contact with Downey's CIA base. Two months later, a Chinese courier was dispatched to gather intelligence. And the report from the radio said he, he arrived safely, he's on his mission. The next time the message was that he'd returned from his mission, had much good news to tell. And uh, 
was awaiting extraction. The extraction plan called for a plane to swoop down to pluck the courier off the ground. It was an audacious plan, not least because the agency had never tried it before operationally. And they asked me if I would fly a mission into China. I said, sure. I didn't object at all. We come in about 50 feet off the ground with the poles extended from the plane and with a hook on it. And the man that we picked up would be sitting on the ground facing the plane with a cut off parachute harness on. And we'd pick him up, he would be jolted off the ground and then we'd just reel him in. I was running the machine, so right off the bat, bang, no problem. They did it beautifully. Norman Schwartz and Robert Snotty volunteered to fly the mission. Both were pilots with Civil Air Transport, a CIA proprietary known simply as CAT. They stepped in after U.S. Air Force pilots withdrew, insisting the aerial snatch maneuver was too risky. And we did it several times, no problem at all. I had nothing but good, complete confidence in them. I think they had more experience, but I also think they had more balls, if you like, you know. As a result of the Fecto Downey case, it was decided that no CIA officer should fly over enemy territory. But that wasn't the rule at the time. It was the early days of the CIA. America was at war, and the inherent risk seemed justified. In a difficult situation, you can scrub it, you can analyze it, and at some point, somebody has to make the call. So on the evening of November 29th, 1952, Fecto and Donnie boarded the Olive Drab C-47 piloted by Norm Schwartz and Bob Snotty, two of Cat's very best. Fecto remembers his final set of instructions from the CIA ground crew. So if you get shot down, don't tell him you're CIA. <laughs> tell him anything, but don't tell him you're CIA. I mean, what are you gonna tell him, a National Geographic Society, I, you know? <laughs> One recurring myth associated with the mission is that Fecto and Donnie hitched a ride for the heck of it. The story that had been received as part of organizational lore wasn't right. It was said that they were on a joy ride. They didn't need to be on that. It was even said that uh, uh, the plane was dropping a team into Manchuria. Uh, none of this is true. And as a historian, I felt like I need to set the record straight, both for the historical record and for the sake of the men. At 2140, their unmarked plane took off, heading due north. We got to the drop zone around midnight, as I recall, 12, 12, 15, on time. They had bonfires in a pattern. I, my recollection was three, three in a straight line. All I could see was a few people. I thought, this is great, and they waved. <laughs> I thought it was legit, you know, it looked good to me. When they flashed the red light down, and I pushed out the cargo, and then we flew away, gave them time to get the apparatus for pickup. They did a dry run first, coming in low and slow, uh, made that pass, and then the next pass was what they called the wet run. This is, this is for real. I looked, there was a man sitting in the parachute harness on the ground. The poles are up, it looked beautiful. And uh, we started our run. And just as we hit the target, as they say, all hell broke loose. They had two American 50s, and they, they right into the cockpit. And the uh, traces came up through the floor of the plane, all around Donnie and I, and they were, they were bouncing up and down inside the plane like popcorn. You know? Then they hit the wings, and, they, and the plane caught fire. The bulk of the fire seemed to be concentrated on the pilot's compartment and the engines. It seemed to be plowing through treetops for a long distance and then pancake belly landed in a, an open space. The pilots were dead, but in the back, the men um, bounced around like peas in a tin can, um, but they survived. They were shaken up, but otherwise unhurt. They stumble out of the aircraft and very quickly find themselves surrounded uh, by yelling and hollering Chinese security forces. It was immediately obvious this was a well-planned and executed ambush. They were coming from everywhere, and they were all screaming and shouting. A couple of shots were fired. Unbelievable. The first guy reached us gave Fecto a whack across the head. And I swore at him, and he took out a pistol and pointed at me. One person spoke English. He said, you know, your future is very dark. But the worst is when I brought in this guy, he said, who is Jack Downey? And he pointed at Jack, and I thought, oh, boy, that's bad. Downey was in the worst possible situation because the Chinese knew all about him from what the ethnic agent 
team had told them. Jack Downey had no story to preserve. Back at Downey and Fecto's base, CIA received a radio message from the team on the ground. The pickup had gone well. The C-47 was heading home. Then silence. Hours passed with no radar contact. The plane simply disappeared. By morning, a cover plan was put into effect. The agency and the Pentagon and civil air uh, transport folks came up with a story that it was a commercial cat flight going from Korea to Japan, and it was lost in the Sea of Japan. As a result, the military undertook two plus days of intense search for the plane. In reality, the CIA was simply buying time. If they weren't dead, if they had been captured, certainly within a period of time, fairly short period of time, they would have surfaced. The Chinese would have wanted to make some propaganda hay out of this. And in the absence of such any such indication that they were presumed dead. On December 4th, 1952, DCI Walter Bedell Smith signed letters of condolence to the men's families. Each was listed as a passenger on an overdue commercial flight, and the families were told, there is grave fear that he may have been lost. By then, Fecto and Downey had been transported 300 miles to the Manchurian provincial capital of Shenyang. There, they were shackled and placed in isolation. Prison of Shenyang was a, it could have been a former embassy building. It was a tall, ornate building with a big courtyard. We were in the basement, and, uh, and there were cells down there. We were alone, tightly guarded, and we wore ankle chains for the first 11 months, something like that. You can feel pretty lonely in that solitary confinement. They said, we can do whatever we want with you. The Geneva Convention does not include you. Nobody knows you're alive. But they kept repeating it for two years. No one knows you're alive. We haven't decided what to do with you yet. And of course, I knew they were right. The Chinese demanded both men confess their crimes. More ominously, they wanted names and places and operational details. Initially, Donnie tried to maintain cover. But with inadequate training, he was not prepared for this ordeal. I found it very difficult to keep track of my uh, false story. I, I was giving all kinds of stories and using false names, and I'd forget which name I'd given to which guy. That was tough, because I didn't know what he was saying, and he didn't know what I was saying. I never saw him again until two years later. The interrogation lasted up to 20 hours a day. Both men forced to stand until they collapsed. Sleep deprivation was part of the ordeal, no more than a half hour at a time, in a remorseless cycle that went on for weeks. Jack Downey felt totally alone and scared. There was no end to what I was facing. I mean, there was no, uh, if I can hang on for a week, I'll be okay in a week, or the war is going to be over. There was nothing. I was facing a, an indefinite period of incarceration, and there was no way I could get out of it. I think it was the 16th day, by my count, I admitted I was in the CIA. Remember, I, I burst out crying at the time. He remained haunted by the feeling he'd betrayed the agency, a view rejected by those who came to understand what he'd endured. He didn't know whether he was going to live, die. He had no idea what was going to happen to him. And so from, that, from the perspective of, look, the people that had betrayed him had already given up the whole, he didn't give up anything that hadn't been given up. I mean, he was in jail because people had compromised the program. He comported himself as a hero in my view. Dick Fecto took a different approach. The Chinese agents didn't know him. So he created a story that shortened his time at CIA and allowed him to withhold vital information. I kept going over it and over it in my mind. Once I got the story straight, I kept, I, I memorized it. So I could remember no matter how many days the interrogation went on, I could, I could come up with what I said. He knew they wanted names, so he gave them names and physical descriptions of the Boston Bonnie. University Bonnie football who? team. I gave the names of the football team and I said, hey, I can get away with stuff here. Sometimes I couldn't. Sometimes I'd get away, they'd say, chan lai, stand up. And they'd make me stand for hours, you know, then put me down again. But I got away with a few things. I didn't get any names for me. It made life worth living in that lousy place. The CIA still had no idea the men were alive. 
1953, as the first anniversary of the loss of the C-47 approached, the agency wrestled with the right course for Jack Downey's widowed mother and Fecto's new wife, Joanne, and his twin daughters from a previous marriage. As this happened in 1952, the agency's about five years old, and it had absolutely no experience with anything of this magnitude. With no evidence that the men were alive, the new DCI, Alan Dulles, wrote to the families, notifying them that their loved ones were presumed dead. Part of the thought process was that it might be more advantageous to the families to declare the men dead and pay the insurance proceeds. I think people understand that you, you made a decision based on the information you had at hand. You made a reasonable assumption of what the circumstance was. You had some obligation to try and come to some closure with the family, and you did. But the family's closure was an illusion. Half a world away, the men were enduring incredible hardship. By the spring of 1953, they were moved from Shenyang to Beijing. There, they each remained in solitary confinement, a disconnected world defined by sensory deprivation. Overhead, a single bulb burned day and night. A five by eight, four cement wall, a thick wooden door. There was a window, but it was covered over. And in the door, there was a little eye hole that had a piece of wood that slid over it. And every once in a while, it would slide up, and you'd see an eye, and then it would close again. The first two years were miserable. I had no knowledge of the, what's going on in the world. I had no contact with anybody else. Jack Downey remembers sitting on his mattress, shaking uncontrollably. This was the closest he came to a mental breakdown. Dick Fecto found that after weeks in solitary, he started hallucinating. For a while there, I felt, I had the feeling that the walls were moving in on me. And then one day I'm sitting against the wall, and I put my foot out, and I measured the distance between my foot and the wall. That phenomenon went away completely, and it never happened again. Then there and then was a voice. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and I could swear there's somebody at the door saying, hey, Dick, hey, Dick. And I actually went over to the door a couple of times and said, what? And there was no answer. I thought, oh, my God, I'm, I'm imagining things. This is awful. By the fall of 1954, the Chinese government had extracted what they wanted and was ready to put Fecto and Downey on trial. The charges leveled against Downey and Fecto uh, basically amounted to making war on the Chinese people, inciting insurrection, uh, engaging in assassination plots, basically trying to overthrow the government. See, I, I'd been waiting for a trial for, from the beginning. And time went by, no trial, no trial. Finally, I, I said, well, I guess there's no trial. There's nothing except continuation of the status quo. And then the trial came, and I thought, oh, God, I might get 10 years for this, because they're claiming I'm the, you know, the, the master spy. Uh, I was taken separately down to the, uh, the courthouse, and uh, O'Donnell oh, was already there. That's the first time I had seen Downey in two years. He had on the black suit, and it looked kind of funny. And I said to him, hey, Jack, who's your tailor? Yeah. And he started laughing. And the guy behind me gave me a boot in the back of the legs. It really hurt. It was fair to call it a show trial. It wasn't a trial as we would understand it. On the other hand, I was not an innocent lad who you know, fell into the hands of robbers. I had been trying to overthrow their government. Also charged were the nine ethnic Chinese that Donnie had trained. The vanguard of the third force now stood accused of treason. The verdicts handed down after just one day of evidence. Life, life, death, life, death coming down. I thought, holy shit. I went from fearing 10 years to being grateful for life. Donnie received a life sentence. Fecto was sentenced to 20 years, returned to solitary, they confronted the prospect of dying inside a Chinese prison cell. Depressed, yeah. But I didn't want to show it. I didn't think I could live 20 years in there, frankly. It really hit me that night. I thought, boy, here's your reward for buck knuckling under to their interrogation. Now you got a life sentence. The Chinese were now ready to break their two-year silence. John Thomas Downey and Richard George Facto, both special agents of the Central Intelligence Agency, were convicted of seriously jeopardizing the security of China. 
suddenly we learn from the new China news agency through a broadcast that there's been a trial and that Jack Downey was sentenced to life. Richard Fechtow was sentenced to 20 years in Chinese prison that changed the game completely. Downey and Fecto pled guilty because they knew essentially they were guilty. The Chinese had caught them red-handed, so to speak. And it's interesting because it mirrors the discussion within the U.S. government at the time when it was mooted that maybe we should try to get these guys out um, through a commando raid or something like that. Uh, in the government, in the U.S. government, it was expressed, well, you know, the Chinese got the goods on them. There was no appetite for a major diplomatic offensive to secure the men's release from a Chinese government Washington refused to recognize as legitimate. After the loss of more than 30,000 American lives, the Korean War was finally over. But communist China still held Americans in uniform. Pressing the case of two convicted spies might jeopardize their chances for release. The CIA ran out of options. We worked with the State Department with the uh, Department of Defense and with a number of other agencies that had contact with the Communist Chinese. Nothing was going to work. There was the immediate issue of preserving cover. Washington's official position was that the men were civilian employees with the U.S. Army. But letters of condolence had been sent on CIA letterhead and signed by the DCI. Those letters had gone to more than two dozen people, ultimately, not by design from the DCI, but because lawyers got involved with the settlement of affairs, executors got involved, family members got the letters, bankers, several bankers, because the families had to settle all of these affairs using these letters of presumed death. In January 1955, as the agency continued to find ways to support the families and preserve its secrets. Fecto and Downey's world was about to be transformed. So I was taken down and told to go into a room. I walked in and the room was full of people and I, I did a double take and I realized they were Westerners. And I, I was just, it was one of the big moments of our time in China. The Westerners were actually the 11 surviving officers and crew of a U.S. Air Force B-29, shot down on a leaflet-dropping mission along the North Korean-Chinese border three months after Fecto and Downey's flight. The B-29 crew was also tried, but since they were considered combatants rather than spies, they received significantly shorter sentences. For three weeks, the Americans lived together with little supervision and expanded privileges. I wonder why they put us together. And of course, they took all the pictures and, and it made sense. The Chinese filmed them playing volleyball outside, trying to demonstrate a, a benevolence in the captivity of these Americans. The B-29 guys were absolutely sure that we were going home. That's what this meant. I wasn't about to agree to that. I still kept my fears. The guards encouraged Downey and Fecto to believe that the release of one group would result in the release of all. It wasn't true. But the Chinese weren't alone in separating the crew of the B-29 from the case of the two CIA officers. A decision not to include Downey and Fecto in the uh, general release of military prisoners uh, because it was thought on the part of the U.S. government that if we insist on including Downey and Fecto, the civilian, the CIA people who were essentially guilty as charged, that we could um, put at risk the entire prisoner release. And so they weren't included. Eleven weary men trudged the last few yards after two and a half years of captivity and torture in Red China. And that was another major reality check. I realized they were getting out and we weren't. Thrown back into solitary, Downey tried to be upbeat, tried to take solace from surviving just one more day, or week, or month, or year. And on the third or fourth year I was in prison, you know, I just pulled myself together and said, you know, enough of this crap. The practical tool of coping was to be as busy as I could. I had my day scheduled right down to the last minute, you know. I really found the most pernicious thing prison was feeling sorry for yourself. In addition to keeping his mind and body active, Dick Fecto drew his strength from flouting the system. I found a nail when I was working outside, 
exercise, there was a nail on the ground. I stopped to fix my sandal, and I put the nail in the sandal, brought it back to the cell, and then I think two years to dig a little at a time. Finally, I got a hole through, I looked, all I could see was feet. All that work and all I could see was, it was disappointing as hell. <laughs> An important coping mechanism that both men came to in their own unique way was keeping their minds occupied. With Downey, it seemed to be more a matter of keeping to a busy routine. So he would construct an elaborate schedule for every day that involved everything from cleaning his cell to preparing food to physical exercise. Fecto used his imagination more. He would sit uh, on his bunk and just think about things. He would create stories. I think to myself, today I'm going to drive to Gloucester and I think all the roads I would take and the turns I would take. I can really take myself out of the cell that way. The one tangible consequence of being convicted as spies was that the Chinese finally allowed the men to communicate with their families. December 11th, 1954, Peking, China. Dearest Joanne, over two years have crawled by an eternity of days. And now, at last, I'm allowed to write you. The memory of our short but so very happy life together has been my bright star throughout it all. But even this privilege compounded Dick Fecto's ordeal. For two months, he pleaded with his wife to write him back. February 10th, 1955. I still have yet to receive a letter from you, but I hope to get one real soon. As each day comes, I find myself hoping that it will be the day. Then his mother broke the news that Joanne was dead. She died in a house fire a year and a half earlier. It was 1957. The Soviets launched Sputnik. Elvis was drafted. And a young CIA personnel officer, Ben DeFelice, took over the Fecto Downey case and for the next 16 years became an unwavering advocate. Ben was a tough, taskmaster. We considered him a benevolent dictator, but many of us would say to Ben, when are we going to see the benevolence? Um, but he was a very smart man. You could just see him in reading the narrative, doing everything he knows how to do to make sure these people are taken care of. Certainly it was early in the history of the organization. Everybody was learning. It, you know, it wasn't rules and regulations. This is what we need to do. These are our values. We need to find a way to make sure this works. Ben said, we've got to start providing uh, strong support to the families, financial support. And towards that end, Ben developed programs I don't think anybody would have thought about. Through trial and error, DeFelice and others finally hit on the idea of investing Fecto and Downey's salaries in a financial institution used for covert transactions. This way, they could use the cover to build a nest egg without disclosing their identity or affiliation. Well, they felt strongly that we needed to go right to the director of the agency uh, on something as serious as this. It didn't take him a minute to approve that. As Ben DeFelice navigated the bureaucratic maze, Jack Downey's mother became a force to be reckoned with. Mary Downey was an incredible woman. Uh, she was not shy about petitioning everyone in the U.S. government, or the Chinese government for that matter, on the issue of her, her son in prison. Mary thought that Ben should be capable of going to the Pentagon and single-handedly telling them, release my son. You could see this woman not giving up on her son ever. Probably not atypical of strong Irish Catholic families, and, and um, you know, she could have been my Greek mother. I mean, that's how tough she was. Uh, when the opportunity presented itself in 1958 to go to China and visit her son imprisoned, at first the U.S. government tried to dissuade her, uh, talked about the problems of even issuing her a passport for the trip. The State Department eventually relented, uh, said that this is not an official trip, uh, but as a humanitarian mission, we will pose no objection. The CIA even found a way to covertly pay for the trip that included Mary Downey, Jack's brother Bill Downey, and Dick's mother, Jessie Fecteau. And I was, uh, of course, thrilled to see her, and my brother was with her and thrilled to be able to put her mind at ease that I was okay. CIA had briefed the mothers in advance uh, that it would be unwise to talk politics. Uh, certainly it would be uh, disastrous to criticize uh, the Chinese government. They said, you can talk about your crime to your mother and you can, you can tell her about that. And I 
figured they're going to use this for propaganda big time. He came into my cell and said, your mother is here to see you. I said, what? He said, my mother's, your mother's here to see you. We're taking out to see your mother. I walked out, they, my mother's sitting there behind a the table. There was a microphone on the table. They had me sit on the other side. We made it very difficult. And I go, oh, are they going to even turn this into propaganda? Damn. But they let her take a couple of photographs of me. And, but, I, you know, I felt really bad for her. And at the end of it, uh, Dick suggested that she not make the uh, trip again. And he, he, he wrote to her later saying, uh, wonderful to see you, but it just takes so much out of me. And I'm so depressed now um, that it, it'd be best if, if he didn't do this again. Mary Downey would make other trips to China to press the case for releasing both men. But Jesse Fecto reluctantly honored her son's request. She never went back. It was a dark time for Downey and Fecto. They went back into solitary confinement. It was 1959, and outside the confines of their cells, Chinese society was reeling. Mao demanded the country transform itself from an agrarian to an industrial society with one great leap forward. It unleashed a tsunami of change. The Chinese communist leadership was trying to get control of China, this huge, amorphous country and they were trying to get a hold of their minds as well as everything else, you know. They were, putting, they were beginning to put the clamps down and to really sort of tighten the screws inside. Despite this, the Chinese authorities wanted Fecto and Downey to appreciate the country's progress following a decade of communist rule. America had a distorted view of China. Mao Zedong, they insisted, was presiding over an economic miracle. And they took us around showing us uh achievements of socialism in the late 50s. One week trip was around Beijing. Took us into the Forbidden City, went up to the Great Wall. And the whole deal was, you know, we're not as bad as you think and so forth. And they took us to some housing, I remember, that we recently built. And they said, you have anything like this in America? And I said, well, it was a lot better, you know. And she screamed at me, for you, even the moon over America is more beautiful. You will never learn. You're gonna stay here a long time. You're a fool. Was shouting at me. And I said, I'm just answering your question. But there was also much the Chinese didn't want the Americans to see. The failures of the Great Leap Forward resulted in a widespread famine that took over 30 million lives. It wasn't long before the food shortage reached inside the prison walls. A sparrow in a bowl. I looked at it, it had the feathers still on it, and I had, and I said, what the hell do I do with this? I tried to pull at the feather, it was nothing. I passed it back, and then later on interrogated said, you didn't like that food? And I said, oh, they're just feathers and feet. It's not surprising that uh, the, the uh, food that they would give to their uh, detested uh, foreign imperialist spy prisoners would be even worse than the usual fare, which I'm sure was not good. Grilled for breakfast for 19 years, nothing else. In the following year, sometimes they put some pizzas of sweet potato in it, but that was it. Life for the prisoners was reduced to a mind-numbing routine. Fecto and Downey found the days dragged on, but to their surprise, the months and years rushed by. One thing that I'm struck by is that there's a lot of detail uh, about what happened uh, to the men from the time of their uh, crash uh, in Manchuria through those early years. And then things seem to settle into a long, almost featureless horizon. The news they received from home was heavily sanitized. The positive redacted, the negative emphasized. The CIA officers were sleepwalking through one of the most turbulent decades in American history. The assassination of President Kennedy, they came in and told me about that, and the Kent State riots, that was it. The whole of the United States could have been underwater, I wouldn't have known. They put a man on the moon, I, I had no idea. I got that when I came up. They were forced to listen to the Chinese view of the world broadcast on Radio Peking. This is Radio Peking. We begin our program with a quotation from Chairman Mao Zedong. The news was heavily controlled by the communist government, but by the mid-1960s, it brought word of a new war that would impact their lives. On September 20th, 1965, 
U.S. Air Force Captain Philip Smith's F-104 took off from Da Nang, heading out over the Gulf of Tonkin. It was to be his last combat mission. Chinese radar picked him up when he strayed into their airspace over Hainan Island. Radio Peking announced his shoot down and capture. The army and people shot down intruding U.S. gangster planes on Thursday. Fourteen months later, Phil Smith was transported to the same prison where Fecto and Donnie were being held. Smith was in solitary, but Donnie wanted to assure him that he wasn't totally alone. Downey was out mopping the hall, and he came by my cell, and he started whistling uh, the Air Force song, Off We Go in the Wild Blue Yonder. And he was doing it where I could hear and understand, and my, what a, what a uh, uplift that was. The CIA men were subjected to an intense daily program of political re-education. By now, Fecto had a Chinese cellmate named Maha, who they suspected was spying on them for the Chinese. Initially, the Americans feared they were being brainwashed, but quickly came to feel that was a myth. Instead, the indoctrination was a welcome diversion from the monotony of their lives. So then they brought me in some cow box, linen, Mao Tzu you know. I read that, I read Karl Marx, Das Kappa. I'll read anything, I told him, give me, I'll read anything. Something to get your mind off it, you know. In early 1966, a reluctant Phil Smith was forced to join the group. And they brought him in for uh, political discussions. And he was funny, I'm not talking any damn political, no, by God, I'm not gonna have a damn thing to do with it, you know. And John, I'm trying to tell him, hey, just go along with it, no harm. I mean, you might learn something about what they're talking about. That's why I, when I read Marx, I said, hey, i am find out what the hell do you mean. But he, he was adamant. You know, and I, name, rank, and serial of a damn them. I, I got a kind of a kick out of me, like a country boy, you know. There was one consolation. Once the indoctrination was over for the day, they were left alone and could sneak brief conversations. My initial reaction was, wow, what, what a great relief it is to finally be able to talk to somebody. Their physical condition was great, and their mind was great. And when they told me what they'd been through, I thought, my, my, how in the world can they do that? I was just amazed. The three Americans suspected it was only a matter of time before they'd be thrown back into solitary confinement. Part of a process Fecto called the whipsaw. It was a familiar pattern. Their captors improved conditions, providing better food, access to books and magazines, or a luxury such as soap, only to take them away again. So beating the system kept the prisoners going. Thanks. You want to talk, and the fact that they don't want you to makes you want to do it even more. So I came up with this plan, and I wrote it in a, on a little piece of paper, you know, got between uh, Maha and Facto, and cut my hand and touched his hand. He looked down and I dropped that piece of paper in his hand, which established our communication system. And the piece of paper said that uh, we could drop notes in the latrine back up underneath the, uh, the wash basin. There was a space up there. You would be able to see it. You got down on your hands and knees and looked up, but just walking in, you wouldn't see it. A rusty nail attached to the screen in the window alerted the men to a hidden message. Turned to the three o'clock position, it indicated that Smith wanted to send a message. The six o'clock position was the return signal indicating it was safe to do so. Nine o'clock was the crucial marker. That indicated a note had been left and was ready for pickup. The messages exchanged were often as trivial as football scores, but that wasn't the point. We were flouting the prison system. We were figuring out a way to beat them, and that boosts your morale. Outside the prison, China was going through another revolutionary spasm. In 1966, Mao initiated a radical program of political purification. The Cultural Revolution was the most chaotic period of all um, in the history of the Chinese communists in power uh, up to this very day. It's, it started because Mao feared. The people had lost their revolutionary fervor, and Mao had given too much of himself to this. He was determined not to let this happen. These young uh, Red Guards, as they were called, ran rampage all over China. The cadres who ran the prison were overthrown, and some of the rank and file took their places. The interpreter, whom we all hated, 
she was overthrown and she was being denounced out in the courtyard. And I told my soulmate, and he, aha, caught up in the Cultural Revolution. <laughs> As the country ripped itself apart, the confines of a Chinese cell block seemed strangely comforting. If they break through the walls and overcome the guards, they may go through there and with the guns and start shooting the people they don't want, like Americans. So I had mixed emotions about whether I wanted this, this turmoil on the outside of the wall to succeed or not, and I figured I was probably better off in the prison locked up than I was out there. <laughs> Eventually, even the distraction of the Cultural Revolution passed. After 17 years, Jack Downey found solitude a blessing rather than a curse. I reached the point where in the last several years, I preferred to be alone. The problem is when you're in prison with somebody, his problems are your problems. I had enough to do to cope with my own situation. Vecto and Downey insist they always knew the agency wouldn't forget them but they couldn't have imagined how their plight consumed Ben DeFelice. For 16 years, they remained his primary focus. We had some naysayers along the years that why are we doing all this? Why do we need to do these special investments? Um, these men are never going to be released. Ben would come out of his seat on that. He loved these men as if they were his sons. DeFelice argued that while the agency could never give back the years, it could provide financial security if Fecto and Downey ever did come home by promoting them along with their peers. And that was significant because he promoted them from early years, roughly $4,000 a year, I think that was a GS-5 salary, up through the journeyman level for an operations officer, which was GS-13. Ultimately, both men reached GS-14 in recognition for service on a mission that stretched over 20 years. We absolutely unassailably can look you in the eye and say, if you are one of us and part of our family, we won't forget you, we won't forget your family, we will take care of you no matter what the circumstances. And you know, this is living proof to everybody that the Central Intelligence Agency looks after its people. By the early 1970s, America was emerging from its own political upheavals. After a painful decade, a new president promised to bring the country together. It can be and it will become the great young generation. That's what I believe and that's what you are going to make it become. Out of chaos, a new global vision was taking shape. Richard Nixon, the implacable anti-communist, was about to play the China card. I was called out and they read the communique which indicated that Henry Kissinger had made a secret visit to Beijing and arranged that President Nixon would be coming to China. And I just packed my bags right I knew this was the, the break that I'd been waiting for, and if I lived, I was gonna get home. The initial signs were good. For the first time in over a decade, Fecto and Donnie were taken out of the prison and driven to the heart of Beijing. Well, we were both surprised, but being taken to the department store, I what the hell's going on? We got, we got no suits, and I said to Donnie, I, it could be very good or it could be very bad. Either we're going to get out or we're going to stay out of the 20. And he agreed. It was, in fact, very good news, at least for Dick Fecto. In December 1971, he went before a military tribunal. And one of them said to me, you are going to be released. You should be very grateful to the Chinese people and to Chairman Mao. Uh, you may not speak to anyone on the way out, and uh, you must behave yourself or you'll come right back again. And I said, what about Donnie? He said, never mind, Donnie. This is, we're talking about you. Donnie made a separate appearance before the tribunal. His life sentence was reduced to time served, plus another five years. In the end, Fecto was spirited away from prison in the middle of the night. His departure revealed not through an announcement, but rather a break in the endless routine. You're listening to everything that goes on out there. And they come down and feed me, and then they go down and, uh, and open Flynn's door, and then they go to Fecto's door. They do that. They bypass his door, and you hear the footsteps, and they go down to Downey's door. What happened to Fecto? Why, is he not in there? That's how I first noticed uh, that I thought he was missing. Fecto was quietly taken by train to Canton and sent across the bridge to Hong Kong. It was the morning of December 10th, 1971. 
for someone in 1971, an American, to cross the Lobu Bridge in a Mao suit uh, and to pop up out of nowhere would have been really quite an eyeful, uh, really quite amazing and quite unusual. It would have raised some eyebrows. I got to the other side, there was a Hong Kong policeman. He says, who are you? I told him, I said, my name is Richard Fecto. I was shot down during the Korean War. He said, what war? The Korean War. He said, that was a long time ago. I said, I know. At that point, the CIA evacuation plan, which had been in on the books for a long time, uh, goes into effect. Uh, we send an aircraft, and uh, we bring Fecto back to the United States. At the Valley Forge Hospital, doctors were astounded by his physical condition. But at first, he was withdrawn, found it difficult to hold extensive conversation or displace emotions. Twenty years in captivity had taken a toll. I was seeing my daughters. There were two when I left. Now there were 22. Man. That was tough. Tough for them, too. Tough for my parents, my mother especially. Fecto reluctantly uh, undergoes a, 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 a media event, a press conference, at the hospital at Valley Forge. I didn't want to see the press at all. Uh, somebody came in and said, do us a favor and just go out and talk to them. I walked out and I looked at these reporters. What guys with beards, or guys with crazy hairdos, funny, strange clothes. And I thought it was like being on Mars. I'm looking around, where is this? His overwhelming concern was to avoid saying anything that would adversely affect his friend, Jack Downey, who was still being held by the Chinese. I appreciate your interest, but I don't care for a press conference at this time. Uh, I'm in good health. But I'm a little tired of being questioned. I'd like to take a little rest on that. He refused a number of thrusts from the outside world. Tell your story. We'll pay you very significant sums. Write a book. Uh, tell us what happened. Dick never did that. He was not willing to jeopardize Jack's treatment or release by simply writing a book. Two months later, on February 17, 1972, President Richard M. Nixon made his historic visit to Beijing. This staunch anti-communist had pulled down the bamboo curtain. Even the prison guard sensed that history was being made. They brought in a TV from some place, and, uh, and we watched Richard Nixon on the TV which uh, gave us a, a great boost to know that the U.S. and China were talking. And if he was actually in Peking, then he, and we were too, and everybody knew it, I thought, well, maybe he was going to be able to pull some strings. Nixon met with Mao, the diplomatic prize that may have helped him win re-election, but not the release of Jack Downey. The Chinese demanded one final act of contrition. The Chinese wanted their adversaries to come clean and to tell them and the world that which they already knew, that these two people that they were, had been holding all these years really were CIA spies. Finally, on January 31st, 1973, Nixon called a press conference to announce a peace treaty had been reached with the North Vietnamese. American boys were finally coming home. The war's over. Uh, many Americans paid a very high price to serve their country. In a remark buried at the end of the press conference, Nixon finally came clean. He was asked if Downey would come home with the rest of the POWs. Downey is a different case, as you know. Downey involves a, a CIA agent, and uh, we have also discussed that uh, with uh, uh, Premier John Lai, that uh, we feel that would be uh, a very salutary action in his part. Nixon spoke over the heads of the reporters to an audience 7,000 miles away. It wasn't an absolute uh, confession that Downey had been CIA all along. It said there was a CIA connection and that complicated the case. It was enough for the Chinese. There was a lot of second guessing, especially in the now East Asia division by operations officers who had grown up with these two men about, we should have said, we should have declared this years ago, they would have been released. I don't believe there was any any proof that had we done this, that it would have resulted in their release. But there was great discussion about it. You read this story, you'd say, well, we should have given it away at the beginning and got the men out. May not have made a difference. May not have made a difference. This may have been just about time, politics, the opening, Kissinger, ping pong diplomacy. May have had nothing to do with it. 20 years of back channel diplomacy and official denials had given way to the subtlety of saving face. On February 21, 1973, 
a triumphant Richard Nixon made a call to Jack Downey's brother, Bill. Hello, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Downey? Yes, sir. Uh, I just had a uh, conversation with Dr. Kissinger, and we have some good news for you and his talk with uh, the Chinese officials. They have said that uh, at the end of this year, positive action will be taken and that your brother will be released. And we wanted to, I wanted you to tell your mother, I understand she's not well, that I wanted her to get the news before she heard it on the television. In fact, it was Mary Downey's stroke that helped break the diplomatic deadlock. The Chinese now had a reason for clemency. Two weeks after Nixon's call, Jack was alone watching a ping pong game on Chinese TV when a guard came in. He said, Downey, I have good news for you. You're going to be released. Our government has agreed to release you, send you home. He said, you better get back to your cell and get your things together, he said, because when it happens, it's going to happen very quickly. And I said, well, you know, if it's all right with you, I'd like to see the end of a ping pong match. And uh, he was somewhat disconcerted by that. It was, I had my expectations extremely tightly controlled by that time. I never uh, had any vain hopes about anything. But this time, optimism would have been justified. On March 12, 1973, after 20 years, three months, 14 days, John Downey began his long journey home. Like Fecto, he was released on the communist side of the Hong Kong border. The world was waiting as he crossed into freedom. There's this British police officer standing on the other side, and uh, he threw me a salute like I'd uh, never seen before, and uh, in fact, never seen afterward either. And never, my one time I was saluted, and it was just a, a real thrill. I, you know, I knew then I was, I was back with friends. But he was also back with journalists, anxious to probe his CIA connection. Well, I, I, no, I don't feel I can uh, discuss my mission. And, uh, I realize that's an interesting question, and I hope you'll bear with me. I just uh, feel that the answer to such questions would have to come from some other source. Downey found it hard to relate to his contemporaries. In his mind, he was still a 24-year-old on the threshold of his adult life. Weeks after the first arrival home, the odd, odd thing was a, a feeling of somewhat of depression. So this is all there is. Even though both Fecto and Donnie were now safely back home, neither wanted to relive the experience. They both refused offers to tell their story. They wanted to move on. The CIA was ready to have them back. But the excitement and adventure had lost its allure. We had offered them their old jobs. Downey, I think, put it very well when he, he said, you know, I just don't think I'm cut out for this kind of work. Both wanted to retire from the agency. But even after receiving credit for previous government employment, their debriefings and consultations after their return, and for all the vacation and sick leave they had to forfeit during their captivity, their accumulated service left them just one year short of the 25 years they needed. But then, for one last time, Ben de Felice came to the rescue. He was ecstatic when we came in that next morning and said, I found a way, I found the way, I know we can do this. He found that for POWs in the military, almost always they would allow a year's reorientation leave. And Ben said, we can do that for our guys. And he did. He gave them each a year. And with that, both men retired from the CIA. But neither slipped quietly away. Dick Fecto was surprised when he didn't qualify to be a parole officer because of the time he spent in prison, even though that time was spent in a Chinese prison while serving his country. But he was honored when Boston University invited him to return to his alma mater as the assistant athletic director. He also uh, reconnected with his first wife that he had divorced. Uh, she had kept a flame going for him all the time, and uh, they eventually got remarried. John Downey received a law degree from Harvard. He fell in love with a Chinese-American, born just a few miles from their Manchurian crash site. He returned to Connecticut, where he served as a respected judge. Both men ensured their lives would not be defined by the confines of a Chinese prison. The agency moved on as well. Their story could have remained buried if not for George Tennant's decision in 1998 to award both men the director's medal. You ask people for a lot. 
you ask of them a great deal of sacrifice, sometimes at risk. Um, in the world we live in, great risk. And it's, it's, it's important for them to know um, that the foundation of history that we're built on, these are our values, and we're going to stick to them. I know that I speak for everyone in this room and everyone in this agency when I say welcome home to Jack Downey and to Dick Fecto, two great heroes of the Central, Organ Central Intelligence Agency. We're so happy that you're home with us today. Well, I know in my heart that it means that this is still my outfit and it always will be. I want to pay my respects and tell you how proud I am to be one of you. Thank you. They were the most significant agency employees perhaps ever. I don't think anybody would be able to say, I could have done that. No one certainly expected them to come out of prison with the strength and, and the personal resolve that they showed. The fact that they were truly heroes, these were extraordinary men by any standard we had in the agency. And they were men determined that we not forget those on that flight in November 1952 who didn't come home. You sensitively and accurately touched upon those people and those names. Our pilots, Bob Snotty, Norm Schwartz, died in that, on that mission. Their sacrifice is recognized on CIA's memorial wall, honoring those who paid the ultimate price in service to this country. They are highly regarded by the uh, flyers among us. They, they considered these guys the cream of the crop. I, I never felt bad about flying the mission, never. John Downey and Richard Fecto are survivors who insist they simply did their duty. But their story defines the essence of the agency that sent them into China and never stopped trying to bring them home.